when leaders are too optimistic on diversity and, oh, it's great, it's going to work, it's fantastic. They actually sort of have undermining effects versus the best possible message that you can have around diversity is that it's good, but we got to work hard at it. And that's sort of the right messaging. Because in reality, if you look at how things work on the ground, even if you get together teams and team composition is based on deep level diversity, you need a lot to make it happen. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to From Academia to Wall Street, discussing DEI at business schools. This is a virtual event co-hosted by Heterodox Academy and the Philanthropy Roundtable. I'm Debbie Gatte, Vice President of Strategy and Programs at the Philanthropy Roundtable. So today we'll be talking about a topic that has become more prominent over the past few years, diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, has become a commonplace acronym, but what does it mean? Is its use in business circles the same as in other circles, such as the philanthropic sector where I work? Today, we'll be discussing how business schools are engaging with the topic of diversity. And um, we're going to be talking about what student outcomes are, um, how viewpoint diversity is involved, and what is, you know, what is the business school intersection with this whole topic? I hope you're as eager as I am to hear from our panelists who bring a wide range of experiences and insights, one might even say diverse views, um, to the table today. But before we jump in, a quick word about why Heterodox Academy and the Philanthropy Roundtable are co-sponsoring this discussion. First, um, the connection between philanthropy and higher education is obvious. Foundations and individual donors provide de generous support to universities to help make teaching and scholarship possible across all kinds of disciplines and approaches. But beyond that, uh, Heterodox Academy, of which I've been a huge fan since its inception, it's a nonpartisan collaborative of thousands of professors, administrators, and students committed to enhancing the quality of research and education by promoting open inquiry, viewpoint diversity, and constructive disagreement in institutions of higher learning. And all of its members embrace a set of norms and values, which they call the heterodox way. So one of the statements that all of those heterodox um, academy members have embraced is the following statement. I support open inquiry, viewpoint diversity, and constructive disagreement in research and education, and that is what binds these thousands of academics together. Now, at the Philanthropy Roundtable, we work with donors who seek to strengthen our free society by advancing liberty, opportunity, and personal responsibility. Viewpoint diversity and academic freedom are essential for scholars to find the best solutions to our toughest problems in our communities. So we believe the work that Heterodox Academy is doing is essential. Now, beyond that, DEI has become a controversial issue in both of our sectors, both in the academy and in philanthropy. And as a nonprofit organization, the roundtable has been asked sometimes to provide demographic information for our staff, our board, even for the donors that we work with as part of DEI mandates from, from funders. Now, we decline to provide this. Similarly, affirmative action and other similar policies have long been debated in the academy. And even today, I think there are lawsuits still going on about admission policies. Yet, yeah, diversity is a value and bringing together people of various experiences, skills, knowledge sets and backgrounds can yield new thinking and breakthrough solutions. So back to our topic for today, how does DEI and viewpoint diversity factor into what we are teaching at our business schools. So with all of this as our backdrop, I'm pleased to welcome our panelists now and I will ask them to turn on their cameras and mics and uh, join me here. And let me just tell you who they are. We first have John Hasnes. He's a professor of law by courtesy at Georgetown University Law Center and a professor of business at Georgetown's McDonough School of Business. He's the executive director of Georgetown Institute for the Study of Markets and Ethics. And we also have Ravi Kudasai. Kudasai, did I say, I should have checked that with you, Ravi, I apologize. It's Kadesi, and I consider this a microaggression, Debbie. Oh my gosh, failed already. <laughs> All right. Lesson learned. Ah. So Ravi is a, an assistant professor of human resources management at the Fox School of Business at Temple University. 
And then finally, Allison Taylor is Executive Director of Ethical Systems, a research collaboration housed at NYU. And she is also a Senior Advisor of BSR um, and an adjunct, adjunct professor at NYU Stern School of Business, where she teaches professional responsibility and leadership. So as you can see, our three guests today have very impressive backgrounds. Um, and I encourage you to review their full bios, which we are putting in the chat for you now, so you can have access to that. So welcome, Allison. Welcome, Ravi. Welcome, John. Um, thank you for joining us today on this, um, I think, very interesting topic. It probably has a lot of complexity to it that we're going to be getting into. Um, before we turn to the panelists, there are some um, ground rules that I want to share. Um, this is a quick rundown for our plan for today. We're going to start with an open conversation. We're going to talk through some questions um, that I will ask the panelists. We will have time for Q&A towards the end. So share your questions at any time. And if we can work them in, we will um, along the way. To do that, please type them in the questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And when you submit a question, it will be received by our behind the scenes team who are uh, there to actually help make sure that we elevate the questions into the conversation. And then finally, and I think this is important, we welcome constructive disagreement. So feel free to ask questions that are challenging. We only ask that they are asked respectfully and in good faith. So. With that, let's get our conversation started. Um, and I think one of the place to start is probably to talk a little bit about what you all do. So business schools, um, they provide specialized and practical education for a real a wide range of students, you know, from undergraduates to executives at, at companies. So you also produce scholarly research on topics from strategy to management to ethics. There's such a range of things that are done in the business school. So before we get into our conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, let's hear a little bit about what each of you does in the business school context so we understand what your work is made up of. And, and John, I will start with you. Okay, thanks. Thanks um, so for the nice introduction. I, I'm a professor both in the law school and in the business school. In the business school, my role is to teach the ethics courses. Georgetown has undergraduate and graduate education. For the last several years, I've been teaching at the graduate level. So I am the ethics professor for the MBA students. And that's my only role. I supply the ethics and I don't participate in the other disciplines which require expertise beyond mine. Okay. All right, John. So that that's the sector, the, the sector within the business school that you're focused on. Ravi, how about you? What are what are you doing? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I teach a class called Power, Influence, and Negotiation for our part-time and executive MBAs. So these are people anywhere from a notch above entry level to basically the top of the hierarchy. Um, if you couldn't tell by the name Power, Influence, and Negotiation, it's tightly inter interwoven with what we're talking about here today. Um, and other pieces, uh, I'm primarily a research track um, professor. So I do research on something just generally called sense making, which is about sort of what happens when things go wrong. Um, and so in that context, um, you know, my research uh, on crisis sense making is largely focused on um, the emergence of the Black Lives Matter social movement, because um, I happen to be in St. Louis when Michael Brown was shot. And so kind of how do local people trying to make sense of a police shooting develop a global level social movement? I mean, it's not at all intuitive that that would be a consequence. So I've been thinking a lot about that. Um, I published some work on the topic. I'm continuing to think about it. And then the other sort of context of sense making isn't what happens when things go wrong, but what about context where things should be going wrong, but aren't? And mm -hmm. these are very high reliable organizations. So um, I do consulting work uh, with uh, nuclear firms, for instance, or explosive demolitions firms. And these are really complex systems. And you have people who all have different assumptions, different routines, different bits of information. But somehow through conversation, they're able to reconcile all these differences and produce um, systems that work and work reliably. Um, and so I kind of think a lot about that as an exemplar of what are the ways that people who are literally living in different worlds uh, within a system can integrate in ways that uh, produce these emergent beneficial collective outcomes. So those oh, okay. are sort of the three pieces, the teaching and then the research. All right, and I can see why that's very relevant for our conversation today. Yeah. All right, Allison, what about you? So what part of the business school world are you in? 
So uh, thanks so much for having me. So I sit in the business and society program at NYU Stern School of Business. That is a repository of viewpoint diversity in the business school uh, right there. My day job is that I'm executive director of an organization called Ethical Systems. That is a research collaboration comprised of uh, well-known business school professors, uh, mainly in the US, primarily but not exclusively social psychologists. And we work on questions of how to build more ethical, effective cultures that encompasses ethics and compliance and the law. It encompasses ESG and sustainability and responsible business. And it encompasses culture, including diversity and, and DEI. Uh, I teach professional responsibility to graduates at Stern to the execs and the MBAs. That is primarily an ethics course, but has broadened in scope in recent years for what I think are probably obvious reasons. And then a class called Professional Responsibility and Leadership at the undergrad level, which is a little bit broader. We read uh, Cicero, we read literature, um, but essentially has the same focus, which is preparing students. And, and these classes are taught in the last year or the last few uh, semesters of the students' time to help prepare them uh, for the working world. Okay, so excellent. I think that's important for us to have covered at the beginning because you all have very different um, insight viewpoints, you know, that you're sitting from in the business school to share your thoughts from. So um, let's dive into this because the topic DEI today um, is, is something that has controversy around it, right? But in the business schools, I think there's a, a special conversation that we can have about these topics. And so let's talk about DEI in the business schools. And when you hear diversity, equity, inclusion, I mean, when I hear diversity, equity, inclusion, there doesn't seem to be a standard definition for what that is, especially if you go from sector to sector. What is DEI? When you use DEI, what do you mean? And Ravi, I'll start with you. Um, I mean, I guess there's a number of answers. There's like the sociological answer, which is that, you know, if you look at where the business needs started from, there's stuff around sensitivity training, then, I mean, so there's this whole sort of trajectory where, you know, part of it was, all right, we just need to, the people are like, so if you, if you look at, for instance, the way college opened up, um, a lot of people through the seventies and eighties are getting degrees, they're going to the workforce, the workforce needs to make adjustments. And so that's where diversity comes in. Um, then all of a sudden people start realizing that, Hey, you know, just having a lot of, you can't just add diversity stir and then magic happens. Right. So then it comes, you know, shifts from sort of illegal. Let's, let's cover ourselves to kind of, can we see diversity as a strength? And that's where inclusion comes in, which is that, gosh, there needs to also be this element of not just bringing people in, but somehow facilitating ways for that diversity to translate into something that's, that's effective. Um, as far as DEI goes, um, I reference it. So that's the, the sociological historical answer that I gave a way too short summary of. But in terms of my teaching, um, I talk about it particularly as a conversation that's out there. I don't think it's all that helpful as a framework in and of itself. Because um, what is the relationship between D, E, and I? Right? It's not immediately clear. Um, so for instance, when I teach about equity in um, my power class, for instance, I much prefer, um, there's an old framework of distributive justice. And this is um, Deutsch's framework, is that there's equity, equality, and need. And so I like this framework, right? So equity is who puts in the most, gets the most out. Equality is, hey, we all get the same rewards, regardless of whatever we put in. And then need is, well, whoever needs the most, whoever's the most behind, gets the most of whatever the scarce resource is. The reason I like a framework like this, for instance, is that you can start to think about complex contingencies. So where do you want one versus the other? So say you're managing a sales team and um, this is a task that each person can do individually. Well, then you wanna reward the people um, in terms of equity. You put the most in, you, you make the most sales, you get the most reward. Versus now imagine you're doing a complex problem solving sort of R&D team, that sort of thing. Well, then you can't really trace outcomes back to individual people. You need people to collaborate over long terms. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So then it's, it's equality. Everyone gets generally the same outcome within the team. Uh, you can imagine something like a training program, on the other hand, where, you know, the real goal is um, to help people who are struggling. So mentorship, training, these sorts of contexts, that has to be need oriented. And so I think just in terms of a framework, I don't find DEI as a helpful framework. I think about it just as sort of like, here's 
a set of conversations that are happening. Now, given that these conversations are happening, how can we think about this in a rigorous way where we have these mutually exclusive and exhaustive categories and each of these can afford some sort of complex contingency type thinking? Um, and so that would be the equity and you could do the same for the D and the I as well. But um, that's yeah. just sort of a, a preview into the way that at least I try to think about it as a behavioral scientist. Right, well, in your, in your scientific approach that you just shared with us, I heard a, a different definition of equity and equality than I've been hearing in other conversations. So right here is part of the problem, <laughs> right? We're using yeah. this term uh, DEI and it's unclear what it means um, in different conversations. So Allison, when you use DEI, what do you mean? One of the interesting things about DEI, right, is that I'm old enough to remember when it was just diversity and then it was diversity and inclusion. And I'm honestly not sure when that E crept in. And I'm actually seeing a lot of people stick a J on the end these days, um, which is justice. So it's kind of interesting how our terminology and our thinking seems to sort of evolve by magic. And someday you wake up and everyone's using this new term. Um, so uh, I think the the inclusion of equity is very interesting, partly because of what Ravi just said, which is it's a wildly misunderstood term um, or one that seems to get people very, very upset. And a lot of the reasons people seem to be very upset is that they are thinking about and conceiving of that term in very different ways. So um, that doesn't answer your question, but um, I put this topic um, in a wider module around organizational culture. Um, we have to cover the legal aspects of this as part of the course, but no one really wants to dwell there or focus there. So I tend to frame the conversation in terms of how organizations can adjust and structure and organize themselves to get the best out of all their people, regardless of social identity, viewpoint and values. And I try to get a good debate and conversation going from the students about the various approaches to do that and what they believe works well and less well. And so I, I, I frame this in the context of culture and I frame this in the context of, of maximizing human performance, opportunity um, and culture as an advantage. Yeah, okay. But yeah, that, and that's an interesting comment that this was way back D and I, and then the E got out, and you're right, I'm starting to see the J added in there. And so, yeah, it's a, I think this is an important question about what do we even mean when we say DEI? So thank you for sharing how you approach it um, in your class. And John, so when you use, when you use DEI, what do you mean or what's informing your thinking about it? Yeah, I don't use DEI. Okay. Um, Ravi and Allison just gave excellent explanations of the importance of diversity issues and equity issues and justice issues in a business school curriculum. My colleagues who do organizational behavior do, deal with this all the time. It's a global marketplace. In order to be successful, you have to understand people from different cultures from different nations with different religious beliefs. The, the market is so diverse now that a big part of management is to understand others and to be able to work well with others. And that's inside the firm and outside the firm. This is very important for business education. Mm -hmm. that's, that's real, right? DEI, at least the way it's used in my neighborhood is something else. An economist friend of mine a long time ago explained to me something called political information costs. And that's, you name something in such a way that you impose costs on its, your, its opponents before they can even address the issue. So her example was when Reagan, the Reagan administration put offensive missiles in Turkey, it called them peacekeepers because then you had to first educate people that these were offensive weapons before you could oppose it. And you impose information costs on others. Things like that still go on today. We're considering a bill, you know, a bill that would provide a great deal of childcare and it's called infrastructure because then you first have to educate people that this is not infrastructure, it's something else before you even address it. And yeah. DEI, DEI is the same thing. What did, you, what, did, what did your friend call it again? What's the, what was her description? Political information costs. Political so, information costs, yeah, yeah. There's, lot, there's some really great articles on it, but that's, you know, that's to the point right now. Um, 
D-E-I means diversity, equity, and inclusion. How could anybody be opposed to that? Right? So first, and you're, you're saying we're not sure what this means. That, of course, is intentional because no one would be opposed to these good things, would be opposed to these good things. And if you put into the terminology things that people might be opposed to, then you skip over the need to actually make arguments as to whether this is acceptable or not, to make it more specific. Um, diversity, me, I'm a member of the Heterodox Academy because I think intellectual diversity is crucially important to the academic activity. I mean, for us to do our job, we need intellectual diversity. There's another question that's important. Should we have preferential treatment for like preferential admissions or preferential treatment for people on the basis of race or sex or ethnicity? That's an important question. That's an interesting question. And the answer is not obvious. That question has to be asked and debated. But if you simply put into the word diversity, which this comes, of course, from the Civil Rights Act, you can't make judgments on the basis of race, sex, or national origin, but you can pursue diversity. So if you simply put into the term diversity, preferential treatment, and then smuggle it in with everything else that we know to be important and valuable, what you do is you jump over the need to provide a justification. So at least in my neck of the woods, DEI is a way of avoiding an important underlying moral argument that we should be having and getting a position that's controversial introduced sort of under the radar. That makes sense, John. This is why even this question comes up of what does D this DEI even mean? And um, you've raised something and it's interesting to have you in this conversation because you don't even use that term um, yourself. So uh, let's get even deeper into this because uh, there is a complex conversation underneath this and all of you are trying to help your students of various types sort through what is valid and what is not valid and what part of this definition do they need to, to think about in their, in their careers. So in corporate America, where your students will either end up or they are currently you know, in, in philanthropy, um, DEI has come to stand for something other than viewpoint diversity, which is what John is, what all of you are getting at actually. Um, and in some cases it can almost start to sound like this checklist approach. Uh, we need to make sure we've got this type of person and this type of person and this type of person. And it's all based on either physical characteristics or, or something like that. Um, so how do you view this distinction? And, and now with, with John's like layering on of, um, he doesn't use the term DEI, but when you think about the distinction between viewpoint diversity which is what unites you all at Heterodox Academy or intellectual diversity, another way of describing it. Um, and this sort of corporate DEI version that does sound like a, a checklist. How, how do you think about those two things? Because I hear both versions. Um, and Allison, I'm, I'm gonna start with you on this. Well, uh, you have viewpoint diversity um, as a result of diversity of social identities. So one thing uh, that is a common thread is, is viewpoint diversity. I think what, so um, that's always my starting point, my starting point for all these conversations. And, and I'm extremely lucky at Stern School of Business, and I suspect the other speakers are as well, that we don't have um, even necessarily primarily an American audience, that the students would be familiar with the, the American framing of this topic, but there'll be students from Europe and China and Africa and Latin America, and so, already you have a group of people that have enormous viewpoint diversity and differences of values and beliefs and priorities so that has to be the starting point i think this recognition that we all have very different values we all have uh, very different beliefs that those are not primarily perhaps reducible to our social identity characteristics and i try to prime the students to be aware of that because you have a less contentious a more open and more constructive constructive discussion about these topics. Um, I think what you just said about 
getting the numbers up and this being treated like a performative compliance exercise fits with a lot of what else we discuss in the class, which is about corporate responses to the law and regulatory scrutiny and how HR uh, deals with harassment and discrimination. And that all these efforts, and I would say a uh, DEI criteria, just the latest, all of these efforts um, are really about protecting the corporate principle from incursions from regulators um, or things that might affect the profit motive. And so you do tend to get this very numbers driven disclosure driven attitude to these much more difficult topics so that would be a theme that i would be using across the class and, and across the course and trying to get people um to think about these things in it in a much more um kind of interesting and nuanced way at the same time i mean these are young people who uh that we don't need to usually make the case that that diversity and inclusion i'll leave equity out of this because i think it's more problematic that diversity and inclusion is a good thing that is not i do not find that i have to spend a lot of time on is there a case for this is there a business case for diversity that's not a heavy lift so then I, I really try to get the students thinking creatively about what works and what doesn't. Um, and then why our leadership teams still do seem to be dominated by a certain social identity and what might be done constructively about that. That has a lot of energy, I think, beyond questions about kind of numbers and criteria, which I think everybody recognizes is, is not super helpful and is driven by other factors than trying to improve um, and make a culture and an organization more dynamic and effective. Uh -huh. Okay, awesome. Thank you. I think there is a lot there that we can follow up and dig into even more. One thing that is a, a really great reminder is your point about the legal requirement sort of driving that numbers, um, the number type focus. And I flashed to, well, I think we've all seen them, the forms that require you to check off and fill in the numbers of different kinds of people that you have if you're receiving a, a government grant or something like that. I flashed that and, and that's a really good point. Uh, and it's a particularly American issue. You're not asked for this information in Europe. Um, and so there is a very particular attitude and I really try not to be too US centric in this conversation because hopefully these people will be run, going on to run global businesses. And I think that kind of, uh, you know, America's particular history with racism, a particular approach to these issues will only get you so far. So really trying to bring in perspectives from other countries is really important if you want to have a constructive, creative discussion. Awesome. All right. I can't wait to talk more about that. So Ravi, what about you? This viewpoint diversity versus this sort of checklist mentality. How do you see that intersection and, and tension? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I was really wanted to pick up on something else and mentioned about this business case is that um, there was a really great article in the Harvard Business Review last year. Um, it was uh, Alien Thomas, um, and they originally made the case, the kind of this business case, and they looped back around. Now, I think they published their first HBR in 96, and they looped back last year and said, actually, you know, people don't take the business case. They just, they, they simply take the business case for granted that, you know, we don't have to make it because it's so obvious. Um, and it's a really brave piece because it says you absolutely can't take the business case for granted. It's absolutely not clear. There's there's not strong empirical evidence that simply having greater diversity is going to lead to profitability in any way, shape, or form. Um, and so, I mean, you can look at, I mean, as a scientist, what you want to do is look at meta-analyses, right? Which are, let's take these individual studies that have been done, let's all compile them, and let's find whether there's variability in effect sizes and how we can explain that. But things like um, greater female representation on boards of directors, for instance, minuscule uh, correlations with, with firm performance financially. Um, and so a lot of these things you know, are taken for granted, but they really aren't the case on the ground. Um, or you could look at, um, and so I think a lot of this has to do with how we conceptualize diversity. So the finding that's come out of things, I mean, it gets really hard to unpack things at the firm level, um, cause you know, John, your economist friend will put out the word endogeneity and then, you know, how do you identify causal models? It gets real complex, but we can do a much better job at the team level, right? So if you look at team dynamics, for instance, um, you can separate out in the literature, uh, the psychological organization behavior literature has separated out two types of diversity. Um, 
And one is what's called surface level diversity, which would be things around kind of um, demographics, aspects that are not directly related to the job per se, versus deep level diversity, uh, where deep level diversity um, refers to things like what is your functional training and background, right? So you can imagine if you're trying to get a team together, you could get a team together based off of their demographics, or you could get a team together based off things like, all right, we got a marketing person, we have a finance person, we have a... And so in that sense, which one would you expect more task relevant, more diverse task relevant knowledge to be present in? Well, probably the one that's based off of deep level diversity. So what the psychological literature and organizational behavioral literature suggests, though, is that basically when you get together teams based off demographic diversity, you get into a form of what's called relationship conflict. So we are kind of having trouble integrating because of personal issues versus when you get teams together based off this deep level diversity, what you get is a different type of conflict, which is called task conflict, which is we really disagree about how to do the thing. So the rub, I guess, essentially, is that task conflict can be destructive, but can also be constructive. And so even if you're assembling teams to have this deep level diversity, right, um, you need to do a lot of work in order to make that task conflict productive so it doesn't then spiral off into relationship conflict. So part of the problem is essentially is that we talk about diversity, but we don't separate out the surface and deep level. And then furthermore, when we're talking even about the deep level stuff, which I wouldn't say is isomorphic, it's not the same thing as viewpoint diversity, but it's maybe closer to that. Um, because just because you have different backgrounds doesn't mean you have different viewpoints per se, right? But when you go to this deep level diversity, even then you need a lot of these like moderating cultural things like do you feel safe to speak up in a team? Can we build trust with each other? Are we co-located? Are we working on interdependent tasks? You need all these sorts of additional factors in order to turn this deep level diversity into something like innovative thinking, into creative problem solving. And so um, the problem, I guess, is that, um, and there's, there's interesting work um, uh, coming out of actually Stern that's saying that, you know, part of the, the, the danger is actually is that when leaders are too optimistic on diversity and, oh, it's great, it's gonna work, it's fantastic. They actually sort of have undermining effects versus the best possible message that you can have around diversity is that it's good, but we gotta work hard at it. And that's sort of the right messaging because in reality, if you look at how things work on the ground, even if you get together teams and team composition is based on deep level diversity, you need a lot to make it happen. And so I think that's one way in which I wish we had a more sort of empirically grounded conversation about diversity um, in ways that we just don't seem to. Wow, okay. You've just helped me a lot actually as a team leader, <laughs> just oh. thinking about a lot of things that, yeah. So this surface level diversity and this deep level diversity, I think is a, a really nice um, alternative way to frame the question that I had about the checklist versus viewpoint diversity. And, but those are two, you, you brought out two different kinds of diversity that are needed for a successful team neither of which is checklist or um, viewpoint diversity exactly. So thank you for, for this, this new formulation for me, new. Um, all right, Ravi. Um, and I was thinking, I also thought to myself, surface level diversity, I would have known how to pronounce your name, right? <laughs> so um, there's an example right there of, of surface level diversity. Um, John, oh, so you don't use DEI as a term um, and you explained very clearly why. Um, how do you think about the, the checklist, you know, mentality versus what you described as being DEI? Are they, is the reason that you don't use the term, the label DEI, the same reason as the checklist mentality, or is there something more to that? No, well, let me answer your question, that, that question directly, and then I'll make some comments. I don't use DEI because I teach ethics. So in my course, there are a series of ethical issues that we deal with. We do talk about um, discrimination, affirmative action. That's something that we consider. We look at the arguments for it. The term DEI, the way it's instituted in the academic world, has no value to what I do because I'm making serious underlying ethical arguments. And DEI is a administratively pushed set of procedures that are, you know, need justification and don't particularly have it. I mean, let me just say, everything Allison and Ravi said is correct, it's true, that's really useful information. I'm fortunate, I'm at Georgetown, like Allison, 
diversity is not an issue because in the room in front of me are people from all over the world, from all over backgrounds. We, we have diversity. Other schools, it won't be like that. Diversity may be an issue, but real diversity and the kind of diversity that you have to learn to work with is important. It's, it's crucial to business education. Ravi made the useful point that, uh, of course, the argument is always made that if we have checklist diversity, that will create intellectual diversity and it's accepted as a matter of faith. I'll explain why. But as he pointed out, the empirics don't support that. And what matters is the underlying empirics of what works and what doesn't. Empirics isn't the issue here because, and Allison's also right, this is a US centered thing. This all derives from United States law. It derives from the way the Civil Rights Act applies to corporations. And the Civil Rights Act is highly restrictive of corporations' behavior. They can't make decisions on the basis of race, sex, national origin, the protected classes. And that means they have to be completely neutral. If you want to argue for something other than purely merit-based decision-making, there's very small area for you to make the argument. And under the law, the way it's interpreted now is you have to call it diversity. It may be that you think that affirmative action is crucially important for reasons of social justice. There's an argument for that, but you can't legally do that. You can't say, I'm going to increase the amount of people in the workforce or in the classroom based on their race or their sex in order to pursue social justice. It's just illegal. So what you have to do is do it in another way. And that is you have to say, what we're doing is we're creating a diverse classroom or we need a more diverse workforce. And that's the workaround that allows you to do things you think are appropriate and useful for you. Like if Ravi could prove that hiring on the basis of race or sex would actually increase the profitability of a company, the company still can't do it. You can't say the reason why I'm gonna discriminate is to make money. You have to have some other way of dealing with it. So diversity is driven, diversity in DEI, not real diversity, is driven by American law. And that's why there's the people in the corporate world, they don't actually want to see the empirics. That would defeat the argument that they use to get around the Civil Rights Act. If the empirics don't support it, they're in trouble, then they're stuck. They can't do what they hire the way they want to. And Allison's right. This is not as big an issue internationally. It's in the United States because of the legal, legal structure within which we have to work. And that's also why I don't use it. It's not a, it's a way of avoiding an important, both legal and really important underlying moral issue that needs to be addressed. And this is a way of jumping over it and saying, now we're allowed to do something we want to do without having to go through either the legal or the moral argumentation to get there. Okay. Uh, all right. So we're going to talk. So it's, it's actually one of the things that strikes me is that this is actually not a new issue at all in business schools. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in terms of, in a sense, you've been teaching these concepts and skills, maybe with different labels um, for it's, it's part of the core business of a business school to teach how to do this, um, these skills well to your students. So I wanna bring in another element. We brought in the legal and we brought in the ethical. What about the political? Um, so part of what it seems like is that DEI is, is also become a political issue. So how do you navigate um, in your classrooms the difference between the ethical and the political or the moral and the political? And, um, you know, is, is there a difference for your students and, and how do you help them understand that difference? Um, and Ravi, why don't I start with you? Yeah, um, something you, you said actually kind of, you know, brought up something for me, which is that, you know, have, haven't we always been th like teaching this? And I mean, so uh, something that, I mean, and it's gonna seem completely trivial, but I mean, if you teach negotiations, the only way negotiations work is based off of differences. Like if two people valued the same thing, exactly the same amount, you could never make a deal happen. Mm. And it's like, we don't internalize that. Difference is the driver of value creation. It's, it's, we don't typically think about that. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that um, we talk about in our negotiation classes, it's an old story 
I think Mary Parker Follett came up with it in the early 1910s, but it's a story that everyone who's ever taken a business negotiation class at any school has heard, which is that there are these two sisters and they're fighting over an orange and they're kind of going to blows about it. And then the mom grabs the orange, cuts the orange in half. One sister gets one half, the other sister gets the other half. But then one sister takes the fruit and uses it to make juice. The other sister, and then throws away the peel. The other sister takes the peel, uses it to get some zest for a pie, and then throws away the fruit. Moral of the story is that they could have both had 100% of what they wanted because one wanted the fruit, one wanted the peel. And this is like one of these things that we really deeply have to internalize when you take a class like my class or anyone else's um, on negotiation and influence is that, gosh, it's actually differences that allow for creation of value, that they wanted different things and the fact that they wanted different things allows for them both to have this integrative win-win sort of solution. So um, something that I stress nonstop, I mean, I have like differences create value and it's like a five part slide. Um, hey, you know, one person uh, cares more about the dinner. One person cares more about the movie. Um, you know, one person wants the big office versus one person wants the office with the window. One person thinks the sales are gonna tank. One person thinks the sales are gonna do well. Well, that's the difference. What do you do? Well, you call someone like John who knows law and you can create a contingent contract. That's a way of arbitraging against these differences in ways that create value. So there's all these sorts of aspects that are you know, kind of deep cultural assumptions and frames of, well, differences are problematic. We need to, you know, no, they're not. If you have basic skills that we can train you in, differences become this huge source of value creation. And so that's something that I, I cannot stress enough that we talk about all the time. Um, I'll be like, hey, remember the two sisters in the orange? Remember the two sisters in the orange? Like, it's just so fundamental to what it is that we're trying to do. And so, you know, hey, haven't uh, we been doing this a long? Yeah, we've been doing this a really long time. And part and parcel of it is that it's, it's a mindset change. It's a mindset where you actually see diversity as valuable if and only if I have the right tools to create that value. So you need to know things like log rolling. You need to know things like contingent contracts. You need to know, have skills like active listening. You got to have personal capacities like perspective taking. And so that I think is something that I wanted to pick up on, which is just, it's something that we have been doing. And I think if you just apply the, I mean, if you just apply the DEI label, um, it makes it seem like these are somehow distinct from core business functions. Mm -hmm. They're not. Things like how do you dispute, uh, handle disputes? How do you promote people equitably who, you know, who have the actual greatest competence? How do you make people feel included? How do you create a good culture? I mean, these are like the bones of any successful organization. And to the extent that we just you know, mark it off in some four-hour DEI seminar, you're actually doing a disservice to that cause because these causes are integrated into the very structure of human organizing. And so for me, at least, like when I try to talk about negotiation, I talk about it as like from a very sociological perspective is that this is something that we're always doing, like, um, like a Garfinkel, Goffman-esque sort of thing of like social orders negotiated. We're always negotiating. And so when you talk about recognizing the value of differences, this is something very fundamental. Um, and so that's been my orientation, that this is stuff that we've always been doing and we can do it within a DEI sort of banner, but it's helpful if we don't do it solely that way. So we can see then how this is tied to the very nature of the firm. And to do that, we need to get this like frame shift in our head of differences, create the capacity for value if you have the right skills. So that's my spiel. All right. So, so Ravi, um, tell me if, if I got this, if I got this right. So if a student is approaching it from a political, from a more political agenda standpoint in class, mm -hmm. the way you're approaching this is to go to fundamentals, which are fundamentals that are necessary for the success of the firm, which is what your role is as the, the professor. Is that a yeah, fair, absolutely. I mean, so summary. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you think about it like this, is that we all approach things from with we see whatever we see perceptually, but then mm -hmm. there are frameworks of interpretation. Yeah. And we have nested deep level frameworks of interpretation and the, mo the deepest levels may be what we would call culture, right? Um, and so these are all things that we're bringing to all of our interactions that we use to interpret things. And so there are all sorts of differences that go down to very deep fundamental ones. Um, and obviously the DEI stuff, I mean, gender is of course it's a cultural framework, right? So, but if we just think about it just that way and we disconnect it from all sorts of different other types of differences, I think we miss the thread 
which is that this is an instantiation of something that's really fundamental. And so to the extent that you can't invalidate DI concerns because they're absolutely real and very serious. And I mean, I felt, I've gone places where I felt absolutely excluded on the basis of surface level characteristics. So in no way, shape or form can you invalidate those. What you wanna do is you actually wanna help contextualize those to say that these are broader problems. And when you contextualize those in terms of broader problems, you give people relevant skills, all of a sudden you're actually empowering them to make a difference, to navigate the tensions that they're facing more gracefully. And that's, I think, what the role of a professor ought to be, um, that sort of empowerment of the students. Firm performance, I don't really care about the firms, I care about the students, you know? Um, so that's, that's what I'm after. Thank you, Ravi, that, that's um, extremely helpful. Um, and I kinda wanna take your class now. Uh, Allison, <laughs> how We're enrolling about Temple University, temple.edu. Okay, got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Allison, what, what about your students and sort of the, this, the political and the ethical um, aspects of this and then tying it to the fact that business schools have been doing this, have been teaching the skills necessary to navigate these conversations um, all along, right? So what are your thoughts on that package of things? Well, I think by the time we get to this topic through the thread of the course, we have taught, which uh, I also suspect is the case in many, many business schools, We've talked about the um, emerging and escalating challenges to the Milton Friedman thesis, and that uh, we just need to focus on shareholder value, which implies, of course, we have very clear, bright lines between business and politics, between the personal and the professional, and between the inside and the outside. So by the time we get to this topic, we've talked about why that paradigm is being challenged, what is going on there, how that explains a business becoming increasingly involved in political and social issues. And then we can bring it up to last summer where we see um, a dramatically different reaction uh, by corporations to the murder of George Floyd compared to uh, the corporation's reaction to, for example, the protest in Ferguson in 2014. So I think it's important to ground this conversation about politics in a wider conversation about what is the role of government and what is the role of business? Why does that seem to have become more blurred? Why these conversations that are on the face of it, policy and legal conversations coming into the workplace? Um, and so then we can, we can talk about, about politics and social issues in the workforce and the degree to which organizations are trying to capitalize on those, resist those, deal with those, uh, stay neutral, fail to stay neutral, et cetera. So that would be my kind of entry point for a discussion around political um, diversity. There's interesting data that I'm sure everybody has seen that questions of diversity and inclusion are perceived as less political among younger generations. So. You know, we have this idea that DEI is something that Democrats like and Republicans don't. That is not the case for Gen Z. Gen Z Republicans believe in diversity and you should be able to, um, you know, choose who you marry um, and that environment is a good thing. So there's also an interesting kind of generational hierarchical shift about these questions. But I think it's, I mean, there's a lot of debate to be had, right, about what government should do versus what business should do versus what business's role is in tackling some of these systemic social issues. So I think that's a lively um, debate. We may or may not get into what companies ought to do about political polarization in the workplace, which is a fascinating discussion. And we get, um, we get very good kind of perspectives there, but, that's my entry point, slightly different from Ravi's, but um, you know, I think I think kind of pulling these kind of bigger threads through this conversation is how at least we're both approaching it, albeit using different narratives. Yeah, different entry points, different narratives. And Allison, now I got to take your class too because I'm actually dying to hear what this, how the students talk about this in the classroom and how they're connecting the dots. So um, I have to look for your course too. <laughs> it's closer to me, um, John. Okay, the, the political and the ethical, how are you, how do you handle that in the classroom? Okay, let me begin by saying you don't have to take my class. <laughs> don't, okay. Right. Okay, good, um, why? <laughs> you asked a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, like, Ravi gave a great explanation 
You said, have we been doing this all along? The answer, of course, is yes. Bradley gave a great explanation of how that's the case. My management colleagues have been dealing with these issues forever because in order to do business with people from diverse backgrounds, you have to know what works and what doesn't. And you get the whole object of business education is to get 100% of the value and not do something foolish like throw away 50%. So yeah, it's been dealt with forever. What's different about what's going on now? This, the important part of your question is what's the relationship between the political and the ethical? And I, I would say between the legal and the ethical, this is really important in the business school setting, much more so than in the other academic settings that I deal with. In fact, the only the book I published is entitled When Acting Ethically is Against the Law. Business students tend to come in with a particular mindset, which I think is a dangerous mindset, which is if it's the law, then it's okay to do it. And all you have to do is just follow the law and that's all right and, and not ask questions. And that's really dangerous because there's no necessary connection between the fact that something is the law and that it's the right thing to do. So part of what we do is we want the students to ask the underlying ethical questions at all time, at all times. What's, you know, I can't talk about the corporate environment. I can talk about the academic environment. What DEI is in the academic environment is it's a massive mechanism for rent seeking. And by rent seeking, what I mean is resources. So at least where I am, we spend massive amounts of money on whatever D, E, and I includes. We get new, we, new hires, deans for this. We shift resources to that, which is all about making the students feel comfortable or included, I, have training programs, and away from the kind of uses that that could serve in um, advancing academic pursuits. And by calling it diversity, inclusion, and equity, we jump over the question of whether these are the empirics, whether these, the, this use of money is really a good use of money. It's, uh, um, it is a way of advancing a political agenda over the underlying ethical questions. You know, it could be that when we do the ethics, we find out we should be doing all the things that we're being incentivized to do right now. That, that's an outcome that could happen, but we're not bothering to ask the questions. We just have a new um, set of people who are the diversity, equity, and inclusion people who do all of the programs and resources go there. It is, there's an important relationship between the political and the ethical, which is being overridden. And uh, it's, there's almost, the last thing I'll say about this is the reason why I am here speaking about it is, I do think we need to have ideological and intellectual diversity in the academy. We really need that in order to do good work. And at least in my neck of the woods, the way the diversity program is working, it is creating a certain type of diversity, the kind you call checklist diversity, and it is retarding the ability for there to be intellectual diversity. We're getting more and more and more people who think the same way, but look different. And that doesn't help with intellectual diversity. I have never been part of any search in which anybody in authority said, what we need to do is go out and find some people who have different viewpoints. Every search at Georgetown is a diversity search. None are viewpoint diversity searches. And what happens is my colleagues do a great job of recruiting people from different ethnic backgrounds that think exactly like them. And if they can do that, they, they get to make the hire much more easily. So I, in a way, I think that what we're calling diversity in the DEI area is actually retarding rather than aiding with intellectual diversity in the academy. All right, let's pick let's pick up on that because I'm curious. Thank you, John. I'm curious what Ravi and Allison think about this. So, Ravi, at your campus, um, is there also a, a DEI um, office, and how how do they measure how do they measure their success? And is it is is it a similar situation where hires are being made? 
with our influence by the DEI office, but this viewpoint diversity is disappearing within the faculty. Um, do you have thoughts on that on your camp based on what you see at your campus? Well, I'm an assistant professor, so I'm not privy to these high level sort of conversations the way somebody like John or Allison would be. Um, but I mean, one thing John said kind of brought something up with me, which is that, you know, we don't talk a lot. I mean, so there's the politics and there's the ethics. Ethics is what's right. Politics is what's expedient. Yeah. So there are these sort of like looping effects, which is that say, say the empirics that I've mentioned are true, where surface level diversity doesn't have a necessary relationship to firm performance or team performance or anything like that. There's that's the first order effect, but there's the second order effect of if you aren't seen doing it, what are your employees going to think? What are shareholders, stakeholders going to think? And might that not have a second order consequence that's negative on terms of performance? So this is, I mean, it's, it's a looping effect is one way of talking about it. Enactment is another. Social construction is another. There's all sorts of words that social theorists use to talk about this. But the basic idea is that, you know, things become real in their consequences, Right. So if we believe that they're real, they start having real effects. And so I think that's maybe one way to think about, you know, these sort of um, ethical versus political aspects of things. Right. Um, another piece that kind of comes to mind also is the opportunity cost, the ethics associated with opportunity costs. Uh, McKinsey, I think, said the DEI industry is 200 billion. I mean, it's, so it's a huge amount of money that's being spent. And if you look at, again, the systematic research by people like Frank Dobbin, for instance, and American Sociological Review, these, these trainings don't have effects. Diversity trainings don't have effects in terms of actually increasing representation. There are other things that do, but these require actual serious commitments, whether they be you know, concrete outreaches, um, specialized recruitment at you know, historically black colleges and universities, whether it be mentorship programs. I mean, these are things that are actually structural and serve to enhance um, people being promoted who are minorities. Um, but diversity trainings themselves don't. Um, and so that seems to be something that, you know, all right, you know, firms politically want to be seen as doing something because that's just what's politically necessary. Um, but there are opportunity costs. And gosh, what if we could do this stuff better? Or what if, so that'd be an optimistic way. The cynical way would be saying, well, firms are just investing in the diversity training to kind of cover their behinds when they could be doing systematic things. So it's far easier for a university to rope a bunch of us into a room and talk about our unconscious bias, despite, again, very little empirical evidence that this is measured reliably, that it can be trained, and that it has real world outcomes. When it's like, if you're the president of a university, can't you actually do structural changes that will increase um, minority representation among management, right? So there's that element, too, that I think is very um, surprising. And I mentioned previously, I've been doing some research on, you know, the social movements coming out of Ferguson. And the thing that blew my mind and actually made me quite angry was that across the board, one of the major consequences and one of the major police reforms is that they started doing implicit bias training. And it's like, this is a life or death sort of situation. I mean, this is very real stuff. And you're using um, yeah. all the meta-analyses suggest that this is not an effective training, that this isn't much more real than... Um, than social priming or any of these other sort of psychological constructs that have kind of vanished under the replication crisis. So, I mean, this is real stuff. I mean, there really are consequences to this. And that's where I, I just think as academics, maybe it should fall on us to do something that's more evidence-based or can we create alternative ways of doing this training? But that's something that really does kind of bug me the way that this is sort of ballooned out. And some of the real people who really care about DEI um, and who really wanna do the deep work in organizations are being underpriced by people who want to go in, give a cheap workshop on implicit bias when there's real work to be done and it's complex work. So I guess this is something now that's coming to my mind about ethics, politics, and doing right by a very serious concern. Because um, these issues matter. They matter to all of us. And that means they matter enough to do properly, to get right. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. So if we're serious about fixing the problem, first of all, are we fixing the right problem? And are we doing our best at fixing it? And are we being innovative <laughs> about how we're doing that? Or have we fallen into these feedback loops? And um, you didn't say this, but virtue signaling as part of that um, package. Okay, Allison, what about, <laughs> thank you, Ravi, what about your campus and any observations around DEI program on your campus and how that intersects with the, the kind of work 
academics might need to do and, and whether the evidence is there that those DEI programs on campus are working. Uh, I'm not super familiar. I haven't been with Stern that long. Um, I have observed there is a lot of emphasis on DEI. I believe that at least some of the demand is coming um, from students. Um, yeah. Fully agree with everything everybody has said about unconscious bias training. There's no proof it's effective. On the face of it, it's kind of bizarre, given that bias is a natural aspect of the human condition, that we're going to the hardest and most fundamental thing to change, rather than decisions and systems and behaviors. And from that, I kind of say, you know, business you know, tends to be very goal oriented. If it wants to get something done, it sets goals and gets it done. So there is a sort of implicit message that by bringing in a trainer, which means we don't have to change anything about what we do. We don't need to hire the person. We can give them a fee. We can bring them in. They leave, nothing changes. It does seem performative and it does seem deflective. And it does seem to suggest that nobody really wants anything to change. So I think that's pretty interesting. Um, on John's points, I think the issues in business are rather different from the issues on campus. Um, I think in senior leadership teams and companies in general, you don't see demographic surface level diversity or viewpoint diversity, or for that matter, deep diversity. Boards are in general ex-CEOs and CFOs that think in the same way and have the very, very same mindset. So the only thing I really want to add, I mean, I think the other two speakers made excellent points is, sort of this narrative that we've all been doing this forever in business schools isn't very satisfying to my students because it does still seem that there is an actual problem. This isn't just a made up problem. Um, and um, when, again, back when I was first in the workforce, it was more that you didn't discuss these things, you didn't discuss um, social identity, you didn't discuss these issues. We had this idea that a, an org, you know, a, a company is meritocratic, you get promoted on ability, um, and that's that. And yet here we are and nothing has changed and there are still more CEOs in the S&P 500 called John than there are women, etc. And so, that's a tough conversation because um, it does seem that we've been doing the same thing over and over again and not getting very good results. And so honestly, I try to challenge the students with that and present the evidence and get them to make suggestions of what they think their senior leadership team should be doing. And also really making that point that if they can come up with good recommendations and they can develop a facility and confidence around these issues, this will help them in their careers and this will be a strategic advantage, not based on their social identity, based on their ability to navigate these conversations and be effective. Excellent, De all right. Debbie, yes, the, both Ravi and Alison have made great points and basically it comes down to this. If you want to solve serious social problems, it's gonna take a lot of hard work. It's gonna take empirical research, it's gonna take learning what works, it probably it may be expensive, but it's certainly gonna be hard work. If you want to appear to be doing something and not really changing anything and just have an appearance of dealing with social problems, then you would have something like DEI. I'm gonna quote a, a friend of mine, a scholar of mine, who explains things pretty well by saying, if you are trying to show that your heart is in the right place, it isn't. And basically what a lot of this is, is showing that your heart's in the right place, not doing the underlying hard work that's required to actually produce a result, but making it so that nobody complains about you anymore and you can just go on. And that actually, at least in the academic world, is very, very expensive. We have limited resources and we're putting them into something that as Ravi has pointed out, doesn't work in order to look like our heart's in the right place. And that means that it isn't. Yeah. Well, that is um, that is a really good summary, I think, of everything that we just heard. And actually highlights why Heterodox Academy is such a, uh, an important organization, because the reason you are all members is because you believe this viewpoint diversity is one of the important ways to actually do the hard work and not have just the surface level um, and superficial conversation or, or do the things that make us feel like our heart's in the right place. 
So um, it makes so much sense that Heterodox Academy is hosting this conversation today. Uh, we do have some questions from the audience and I wanna turn to them because um, I think a lot, of, a lot of things came up. So uh, here's, here's a question for all of you. Um, how can broader discussion of business ethics improve approaches to DEI? Does DEI relate to any fundamental principles of business ethics and how can business ethics seriously promote ethical conduct while respecting diverse perspectives about what constitutes ethical conduct? So um, we have a questioner who's really interested in the relationship between business ethics and how we're teaching that and um, fundamental, you know, the, the concerns around DEI. So I think we touched on this somewhat um, during our conversation, but John, do you have anything to add? Um, yes, but I'm afraid to do it because I don't want to take up all the time. Since I teach business ethics, this is what I deal with all of the time. And actually at Georgetown, I think we have a wonderful, brilliant, innovative way of teaching business ethics that is a response to a 2013 article in the Wall Street Journal, the headline of which was, does an A in ethics in business school have any value? And the article said no. And so our mission is to make it and give a yes answer to that. And at least the way we do it is you look at the ethical requirements built into the practice of business itself and what it means to act with integrity. And you teach it that way. You teach it, this is the ethics, this is what's required to act properly and be a business person that has integrity, and that's what drives things. You don't say, let's take this issue and stick it in. Let's take this issue. Let's talk about diversity and stick it. To the extent that matters of dealing with diversity is part of what is ethical business practices, it's part of your course. Otherwise, you don't want to have, you know, most courses are, let's talk about the relationship between stakeholders and shareholders. It's boring, it's not relevant to anything. If it doesn't help, then don't have it as part of your course. What you want is a course that actually addresses the important aspects of ethics. The other thing we do is we send the students out and say, go do some good in the world and see how difficult it is. So have some actual experience and that's how you'll learn about ethics. Don't listen to us talk about it. All right, so that's a long way of saying, with regard to business ethics, you do business ethics and you don't look outside for other things and try to shoehorn it in if it's not actually part of what's necessary. Do I dare say you don't take a checklist approach to business ethics and teaching it? That is, that okay. is yeah, you right. can say that. Okay, Allison, so you also teach business ethics. Um, any, any additional comments that you wanna add here? Um, well, we teach uh, students about the philosophical and psychological grounding of ethics, which is how academics tend to approach ethical questions. They're philosophers or they're social psychologists. I tend to uh, contrast that with what the business world calls ethics, which is uh, in general either compliance or now increasingly sustainability in ESG. I tend to argue that neither of those disciplines have that much to do with ethics and everything to do with protecting the organization from legal or regulatory scrutiny, yeah. uh, which uh, then implies that you can't trust compliance and you can't trust HR. And that puts the burden on you to be an ethical leader and set the culture and set the tone. So I try to end with an idea of personal responsibility and empowerment and it is up to you to set and change the culture and relying on these functions that we call business ethics is actually not going to protect you because the the role of those functions is to protect the corporate principle not to protect you so um because when you're young you tend to think that hr might help um i try to um give them a sense of, of both you know how academia approaches ethics and then what that looks like in a real corporate environment. We also talk about things like whistleblowing. I think that's very, very relevant to questions of ethics and questions of diversity, because it is about your ability and willingness and comfort level with speaking up. Um, and so, you know, trying to kind of draw these threads uh, throughout the class and not put DEI in a bucket in week five, 
that won't be very helpful for all the reasons we've already covered. <laughs> the real world just not does not operate that way. So thank you, Alison. Uh, Ravi, do you have anything to add on this question around um, how we're teaching business ethics? Um, yeah, so viewpoint diversity around ethics is something that's really fun for me. I'm not an ethics person. I'm not a scholar of it. But um, something that I'll do very often is, you know, uh, I there's a validated scale about questionable behaviors and negotiations. And so I have all, you know, my students fill it out. And then I put up in real time, the pie charts and the graphs and the histo maps. And um, uh, it's fascinating to get these conversations around like, oh, how can you think that's possibly ever, you say that, you know, it, you think it's acceptable to um, give someone gifts in order for consideration. I'm a doctor, uh, the chief of cardiology. That's that's horrible. Well, I'm in sales. Very different world. Or have you ever worked in China? Like I have, I managed PhD students in China and they regularly on Lunar New Year will give you a gift. And if you reject the gift, it's super uncomfortable. Like, But I would never take a gift from an American student, right? So I think just having these sorts of conversations um, is helpful because again, like there are frameworks that shape how we view things and there are these differences and we're never gonna negotiate effectively unless we can understand the frameworks that are animating and giving rise to the behaviors of other people. So I get a lot of value out of that. Students get a lot of value out of that. Um, maybe on occasion in a blue moon, I'll talk about like, oh, you know, deontological versus consequentialist versus virtue ethics. But like, I, I think that's kind of just up in the air. I, I think what we really need is a grounded sense of how are people actually making sense of concrete interactions and how through your better cross-cultural or cross-industry understanding of these frameworks, can you be more effective in navigating these spaces? I'll add a couple of examples. You're, you're right. You can dispense with the abstract philosophical reasoning. You don't need that in business school. You need that yeah. in philosophy departments. But you talked about negotiations. A colleague met at Georgetown somewhere else. He teaches negotiations, and he has them do a series of 10 negotiations. The 10th is designed so there's no way to make a deal without acting unethically. Mm -hmm. And by the time they get to the end, they make a deal. And he looks at them and says, how did you make that deal? And it shows them that if they're not paying attention to ethical issues, they can easily overstep them. So the exact that's, one I use, John. And it's interesting because it it's embedded within a principal agent relationship. So yeah. it gets into some of these dynamics as well. Right. So that is so much more how the, that yeah, is how the real world actually works, right? In terms of in terms of when you do have to apply ethical considerations. So um, my colleagues here do a role playing exercise where you put them in different roles. And people who were assigned certain roles would, who would never, never do anything wrong. Well, they decide they're gonna keep a, mar a drug on the market that's causing deaths, even though there's a better one out there. And when, they're, when it's over and you look at them and say, why did you do that? It's just a game. But once they're in the role, they overlook the ethical issue. So business ethics in a business school is should be an experiential learning type of process where they have to actually go through the ex exercises and they find out that it's not that they're bad people, it's that they're not paying attention in the right way. And that's how you can get in trouble. Mm. And exactly. this is actually a great way to bring our conversation to a close because believe it or not, that was already an hour and almost 15 minutes, but it, it um, reminds me of why this whole con this whole topic of viewpoint diversity is so important because when you're in the real world making business decisions you need people who are looking at the problem from different perspectives because one of them may be the one that surfaces what the what that ethical issue is and saves the business from making a, a big mistake right and um a viewpoint diversity in in the classroom is what you're all encouraging and so i actually take heart in that and i'm serious when i say <laughs> i would love to take your courses because um i think we're missing a lot of that in today's cultural conversation so thank you for encouraging that in your classrooms um so we are at the end of our our time and thank you for the to panelists for joining us today and for this really really interesting conversation which i hope will continue um, and thanks to the audience for joining us today. Before we wrap up, there are a couple of quick announcements that I would like to make. One is that Heterodox Academy's next public event is a panel conversation titled Faith and Truth Seeking, What is the Role of Religion in Higher Education? Um, and that's going to be on Monday, July 26th at 7 p.m. Eastern. Registration is now open and it is in the chat. Uh, the link is there. So if you'd like to sign up for that, please do. 
Uh, for donors and funders who are in the audience and who would like to learn more about the Philanthropy Roundtable, please feel free to reach out to me by email and you can do that through Heterodox Academy. Um, for anyone who would like to stay abreast on what we are doing at the Roundtable, if you visit our website, link coming in the chat, um, there is a newsletter that you can sign up for and stay in touch with our activities. And then also on our homepage, you'll see information about a new campaign we're doing called True Diversity, where we set out some principles for how we believe diversity can be a strength in the nonprofit sector and why we think it's critical that we continue to openly discuss this. Um, so we are going to put that in the chat for you as well. And with that, thank you, John, Ravi, and Allison. It was a great conversation. I look forward to staying in touch and uh, we'll talk to you later. Thank you.